Anyways, our next speaker, and I'm kind of happy that he's here because he spends a lot of time in Toronto, obviously working with researchers here. But Guy Burke is an associate professor at McGill University in Human Genetics, and he's also the director of bioinformatics at McGill and uh, the uh, Genome Quebec Innovation Center, so that's the science and innovation platform in Montreal. He did his PhD uh, on geo genome rearrangements and, and evolution with Pavel Pesner at the University of Southern California. And in 2002, he did a postdoc with and in gene regulatory networks with David Sankoff at the University of Montreal. I thought he was at the University of Ottawa. No, he was sort of like both. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> well, a lot of people seem to do that, actually. They just commute, I guess. Uh, from 2004 to 10, he worked at the Genome Institute of Singapore, which would have been great, but you can't spit gum on the ground. That's right. Um, where he was a senior group leader and the associate director of computational and mathematical biology. His uh, research interests are in comparative and functional genomics, uh, with a special emphasis on applications of NGS sequencing technologies. And I haven't seen you speak in about three years, so I'm, this will be great it'll, to catch it'll be up. the same thing, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm sure it's a lot further along. Anyways. All right, thank Welcome. you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to see a few familiar faces here. Um, if you're wondering what the connection between the first talk and the second talk is that we have the same boots. <laughs> uh, that's about it, uh, from what I can it's tell. Fashion. <laughs> that's fashion. That's right. Uh, no, no, but seriously, so I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I have many slides, so I'll get started. I'll, I'll try to go through a few things uh, today. Um, my title sort of means a lot of things and nothing at the same time. And like, I'll just put something and then talk about whatever I want. I'm not planning to really map all the functional elements of the human genome myself, but as you'll see, I'll, I'll be talking about some of these things. Um, so I'll, I'll cover just a brief overview first of, of next generation sequencing, but I'll, I'll, I'll zoom through that quite quickly and application to functional genomics. And then I'll, I have two, really two parts of my talk. Uh, one is talking about some of my research interests and some of the projects in my lab that's, that's looking at transposable elements uh, as, as functional elements in the, in the human genome. Uh, so I'll give that as an example of, of functional genomics, but then I'll broaden the scope a little bit and talk about more generally some of the challenges uh, with, with these types of analysis and these types of, of uh, data sets and, and how uh, we can come up with some strategies, I guess, to, uh, to make sense of some of these data sets. So, so again, I'm sure this, this slide you've already seen many times and, and most of you are familiar with this, but you know, with, with the significant drop in sequencing costs, the number of applications and the kinds of things that we can do with next generation sequencing has dramatically increased. Um, you know, going from, uh, you know, now almost 15 years ago, the sequencing of the human genome that, that was a major endeavor and cost billions of dollars uh, to, to a situation where we can now sequence human genomes for not quite hundreds of dollars yet, but definitely lower thousands of dollars. Uh, what can we do with these technologies? So the first thing, the first type of application that, that comes to mind, and, and that was really how this all got started, was the sequencing of genome, genome sequencing, sequencing of, of, of genomes. Uh, but we sort of quickly ran out of species and genomes to sequence at the, with, with, uh, at, at, you know, with the cost going down. So going from uh, sequencing the human genome to model organism to sort of targeting extreme organism for, for, their, for, for specific functionalities. Uh, we've, you know, we've now moved to projects like this Genome 10,000 uh, 10K, where the challenges are more sample collection, data processing, and no longer sequencing. But, but, so I won't be talking about you know, sequencing applications today. I won't be talking about this other big category of application uh, which are keeping, you know, places like, uh, I'm sure, folks sick in the, the Innovation Center uh, where I work, because I guess that's the bulk of the sequencing that we're currently doing is really resequencing uh, projects where we're sequencing, there's the ICGC project that, that uh, is, is based here as well, falls into this category where we're interested in, in really cataloging uh, the variability between individual both in, in health and disease to try to understand uh, the impact of genetic variants in, in, in various contexts. Uh, this is true both uh, for human applications, but it's also true uh, in, in other areas, including agriculture and, and studying different crops and the properties of these different crops. 
So right now, I mean, in terms of, of, of major investment and major application of next generation sequencing, I'd say that, that that's for sure one of the very big areas. Um, but you know, but my lab and, and my interest in what I'll be talking about uh, today uh, resolves more around uh, application, which is applying these technologies to study uh, the biology, I guess, of complex systems. So applying sequencing technology and, and, and applications such as ChIP-seq, RNA-seq, to study um, the, the dynamic state of the genome. So uh, ChIP-seq to look at, and I'll get to that, but of course the genome is not, uh, it's, it's, it's not static, it's dynamic. In different contexts, it's expressing different sets of genes, so we can use RNA-seq to characterize which genes are expressed in these different contexts. Uh, similarly, we can use ChIP-seq to understand, uh, and this is what I'll be talking about today mostly, to understand uh, how you know, various regulatory proteins that are turning on and off these genes in, in, in different contexts. So just like, um, so, 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 you know, from initially, I guess previous to these technologies being available, uh, these were done on sort of a single gene types of experiments. Microarrays came along and, and, and allowed uh, to, to probe all the genes in the genome in different contexts. Uh, but now we really are getting, uh, we now, because the technologies are sequencing are so cheap, uh, we're getting access to profiles that are really uh, looking at the dynamic state of the genome, um, you know, at, at the single base resolution, pretty much. Um, the, the goal here is really to try to, you know, by combining information, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit, but by combining information from, uh, from, from regions that are accessible in the genome, with, with information about expression, you know, how, what, what can we learn about the underlying gene regulatory network, for instance, uh, that really drive responses uh, in, to, to different stimuli, or uh, that, that differ between health and, and, and uh, healthy and, and disease states. Um, so, so these data sets, so if you go back and this, you know, this is sort of an oversimplification of what we knew, I guess, after, what, after the human genome sequencing. So this is a snapshot from the human genome browser. Um, you know, even uh, so, so close to a decade ago, um, we had, you know, uh, the identification of genes within the human, the human genome. We had a very good catalog for that. Uh, still growing at some level, I guess, but still there was a very clear signature within the human genome associated with, with uh, coding sequences. So you know, both from, from EST libraries and so on, we had a very good sense of where genes were within the genome. But this only accounts for, for 2 or 3% of the human genome. Uh, what's, what's, and then, but you know, how does the rest of the genome actually work? What's the regular code that actually uh, helps guide the cells in different contexts to respond to the environment? Uh, or and more in development. Um, so, so from from this type of a very static map of the human genome, um, we're actually interested. In this, I mean, what I'll be describing is really uh, the studies that are probing not just the genes themselves, but the rest of the human genome sequence and how it encodes a uh, signal that's recognized by various proteins that are expressed in the appropriate cells. Uh, to turn genes on and off, and, and as I said, uh, both in development and in response to the environment, uh, dynamically modified, not modified, but uh, makes use of the genome in these different, in these different contexts. So the, the, the types of technologies and data sets that I'll be talking about, the ChIP-C uh, is, is one of them. Um, so this is a, a technology that uh, was the, the, the technology for, for chip, for the chromatin immunoprecipitation, was developed a long time ago, but again, this was done on a gene base, gene by gene basis initially, or locus by locus basis. But um, so, where if you're interested in a particular protein, a regulatory factor, uh, and how it actually, you know, what gene it's turning on and off, it's helpful to know if it's recognizing uh, DNA, it's helpful to know where in the genome it's actually found. So going back, I guess, to this slide, we're interested in where uh, the regulatory protein red binds in the genome 
there's quite a bit of work that was done in trying to predict where it was bound, but it depends on a lot of things. And in the end, actually getting data sets genome-wide that tell us where that particular protein is bound is going to be very useful to actually try to improve on these models that try to predict uh, and, and understand that, that regulatory code. So, so the assay is, is, is pretty relatively simple, where you, you cross-link the regulatory protein that you're interested in, if it's P53 in cancer, or if it's OC4, as in this case, OC4 is a transcription factor that's very important in stem cell biology during in development. It's one of these uh, key master regulator in stem cells. Uh, so if you're interested in the genes that are regulated by OC4, you actually cross-link OC4 with the DNA, um, and all other proteins, I should say, with the DNA. You have an antibody that recognizes the protein of interest, such that you enrich for the a pool of DNA fragments that are bound by the protein of interest. Uh, and now, again, because sequencing is cheap, you just sequence, uh, you just sequence this population of reads, and, and map them back on the genome and look for these types of clusters that are an indication of where uh, the protein is found. Uh, you get some noise, but you get clear patterns uh, associated with regions that are bound by the protein of interest. So this is JC. Um, similarly, uh, but now at the level of expression, or any seek, you make use of, um, so I'm sure familiar to most of you, you, you just make use instead of hybridizing uh, your library on microarrays, you're just sequencing this after it converted to the RNA to cDNA, and you just sequence all of the reads and you map them back into the genome. Uh, so, so you get from this data sets about protein occupancy in the genome and data sets about uh, expression in this case of, of various genes. Um, but now, one of the, one of the interesting things uh, is that in contrast to the human genome for which, you know, there's, old, may, there's mainly only one, and then you might be interested in the variability between individuals, but still, there's only, there's, you know, there's only one human genome. Um, you might be interested in the state, the dynamic state of that genome, looking at the particular protein uh, in different contexts, in different cell types, in different conditions, and so on. You really have, so this is the same, region as I was showing you before with the genome talk, but you've got, of course, you're now probing this genome and how it's actually uh, behaving or how it's being activated uh, in different contexts. Uh, so, so you end up with, with quite a large collection of, of data sets. Um, so this, this data is all coming from ENCODE in this case, um, but what do you get from this? So you get information, so this is now sort of a compressed version of this, but uh, on top of the information, this sort of static annotation, either of genes and I didn't, you know, there's of course additional static information about the human genome that I didn't include here, but you're getting all of this sort of dynamic annotation that's dependent on the, the cell type or the context in which the experiments were performed that gives you information about transcription factor binding sites from ChIP-seq. So this, this was done by ENCODE probing a different cell type different factors, um, but you see that they all, you know, uh, so all of the, the, these peaks that have been detected tend to cluster in this region that clearly corresponds to the, the promoter uh, and, and, and enhancers associated with either this gene or this gene, uh, you know, methods that actually can link up an enhancer to a specific gene are still sort of in development, but you definitely get sort of a, a, a a very rich annotation of this region uh, in different contexts that you can then mine for various things, but clearly highlighting in particular this, this region as being uh, active uh, in these cell types that were that have been probed. So you can now imagine that we can make use of this information to try to understand, um, you know, how how do we would how do we interpret, uh, uh, you know. Uh, a SNP, for instance, in, in the particular, you know, we would probably, if, if a SNP, if a, if a variant, the position that's variable in the human population is hitting a coding sequence, we know how to interpret that because we know what the change in amino acid, whether it's synonymous or non-synonymous, whether it's likely to have be an uh, impactful mutation. But how do we interpret variants that are outside of genes? Well, this is starting to give us a sense. Uh, if you have, you know, in the middle of nowhere, 
uh, a variant, then it's less likely to be functional than if you have a variant that's actually associated with some of these active regions, or at least that's, that's the, uh, that's the uh, assumption. Um, so, so these data sets were, were coming from ENCODE, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, the stuff that I'll be talking about as well towards the end uh, is, is coming from the International Human Epigenome Consortium, which is, uh, which is now an international consortium that builds on top of what ENCODE and the NIH roadmap in the US has already done. Uh, that's now more international with many countries actually participating, including Canada. And we're one of the sites that's actually contributing, one of the two sites with, with uh, the, the, uh, the Genome Center in BC that's contributing to this international consortium that aims to really characterize uh, you know, the dynamic state. So here, the dynamic state of the genome, I didn't even use this word yet, but this is what we call the epigenome uh, in this context which is really uh, you know, on top, this additional layer on top of the, the genome, which is uh, the dynamic state of the genome in different conditions, uh, whether it's different cell types in response to the environment or in these uh, different uh, healthy or disease states. So ENCODE was doing this mostly at the level of, of cell lines and characterizing how different the genome behaves in different or, or you know, in, in the different cell lines. But as uh, the technologies got better, uh, you know, uh, the you know other types of uh, you know material was usable for the same type of experiments. So the roadmap focused then more on actual tissues that were accessible and that could be. So there was you know the, the assumption is that cell lines probably uh, have a, a state that's not the natural state. So it's worth actually looking at. Uh, uh, at the cell of actual, you know, it, uh, of actual tissues, human tissues mostly, um, and and the and some of the main areas of, of focus now of, of the next levels, uh, of, you know, as part of IEC is to also now look at not just you know it's not enough to have one data point from one particular cell type, but we're interested in the variability between individual and the link between genetic differences and how that actually affects this epigenomic profile. Um, but, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that a little bit. Uh, there's already you know, thousands and thousands of data sets of these dynamic data sets that have been produced uh, as part of this consortium. Um, so but, but before talking about, um, before talking about um, these, these, this consortium and some of the data sets themselves, uh, I wanted to give a sort of a concrete example uh, of, of how these data sets can actually be used uh, to, to, to learn new things about, about how the human genome actually functions and some, some of these functional elements in the genome. And this again is, is sort of directly related to some of the work that's done in my lab. Um, so just as a quick introduction to transposable element, uh, which is really what, what I'll be talking about in this section. Uh, transposable elements are, are short sequences uh, that have inserted in our genome and have, have the ability to make copies of each cell, most usually through an RNA intermediate, but uh, some are of viral origin, I'll be talking about that, but these are the L1s, the ALUs, and so on. You have a master copy that inserted into the genome, which then made, uh, during a period of time, multiple copies of itself within the genome. As time evolves, um, these, you know, these families then are no longer active, uh, and, and gradually they accumulate mutations, such that that's why I'm showing that they're you know, shaded. Um, but additional families are, are going to be active at different times. Uh, and even though, uh, even though, again, most, for instance, in the human genome, most of these families of transposable elements are no longer active, uh, but we can still identify and see the remnants of these families uh, just because they're, they're, there's multiple copies, sometimes hundreds of thousands of copies of the, those short sequences. Um, so this is the process by which transposable elements have populated the human genome, and, and it's quite, I mean, this was one of the striking results from sequencing of the human genome, for instance, but that was also known at some level before. But you know, depending on how you count, 
at least you know, close to 50% or sometimes more than 50% of the human genome uh, consists of these elements. Uh, so L1 and L2 are, are the most common uh, in terms of the, the total, uh, their success, I guess, at, at uh, populating the human genome. And you've got some additional uh, families. One particular family that, that I tend to study quite a bit are the ones that are the retrotransposon that are of viral origin. But again, I won't go into the, too much of those details. But it's quite interesting to see that um, you know, about 25% of the human genome uh, consists of lineage-specific repeats. So these are things that don't exist in rodents. They're really human-specific. So a lot of the new DNA in our genome really is coming from these elements. And again, to keep that you know, in mind, they're roughly, typically, they're just you know, 1 to 2 kb, or sometimes a few hundred base pairs, and they're relatively short, but you've got hundreds, if not thousands, of, of copies, most of them usually thousands of copies, that are spread out through, through, uh, throughout the genome. So, um, so it was hypothesized long, long ago, actually, that these transposable, so the question is, do they do anything? Is that junk DNA? Do they do anything, or do they really, uh, have they, you know, uh, acquired a role in terms of, so at some level, this is a, you know, this is a parasite in our genome, and so it's doing, it's a selfish thing, it's doing its own thing in our genome, and maybe we just tolerate it. One question is whether it's actually has acquired a function, it has been picked up by the host, us, uh, and, and really is associated with actual function. Um, so, you know, I, I, this is maybe a bit complicated, but one question is, as you have, as you have these elements jumping around, did they actually carry regulatory signal that's actually being also used to regulate genes in different ways? So this was an old hypothesis that dates back uh, to the 50s, actually, but and for which there were examples, but that you know the extent at which these elements were functional sort of remained to be to be tested. Um, so one of the experiments uh, that we did, and this was work in collaboration with with a lab at the Genome Institute when I was in Singapore, uh, was to, com to compare Chipsy profile from some of these stem cell uh, transcription factors that are key transcription factor, OC4 and anon, CTCF was their sort of a control. Uh, so different uh, transcription factor in, in both human and mouse ES cells combined with expression data. In this case, this is actually coming from, from microarray where we had uh, you know, knockdown of, of one of these factors and looking at, at how genes uh, were deregulated just to see uh, how, how different, I guess, the regulatory network uh, could be between human and mouse and whether these transposable elements are contributing to some of the differences between the two networks. Uh, so one of the things that was quite striking from, from this, uh, so this is now looking at human, looking at some of these data sets, um, is if you look at nano, for instance, one of these transcription factor, and you look at this family of, of repeats uh, that's called LTR7, so that's part of these LTR endogenous retrovirus. So there's 2,000 instances of that, re that particular repeat in the genome, uh, but 800 of those are bound by, the, by nano. So this is highly uh, unusual. I mean, if you have, you know, depending on how you do the model, you would expect very few of them because there's not so many sites by nanog. So this looks like a clear association between nanog and uh, a particular transposable element family. So if we sort of compile that across across a different repeat family, we get that uh, on the way to the human or on the way to the mouse. Uh, for these various factors, you really have a significant fraction of these binding sites, of these peaks, uh, that have been contributed by different families of transposable elements, of repeats. Uh, in mouse, uh, and Michael here would know this well, but in mouse, uh, here, uh, you know, if you look, more than 28% than, than, than 20, of the CTCF binding sites in mouse are embedded in just one family of, of repeat, which are the B2 repeats. That family of repeat doesn't exist in humans. So these are all new binding sites in the mouse that didn't exist in the ancestor of these species. So clearly, um, at least at the level of binding, 
we see quite a lot of new sites that appear to be active. Well, at this stage, all we know is that they're bound. But there's lots of new mining sites in both human and mouse that are coming from these, uh, these transposable elements. Uh, in terms of a bit more functional data, uh, this is now looking at the other data sets, the expression data. Uh, so this, again, we now knock down R4, which is you know, the key transmission factor both in human and mouse and cells. If we knock down R4, some genes go up, some genes go down. The genes that go down, the, the, I mean, the thinking is that those genes were, when R4 was there, were actually targets of R4, they were upregulated. So what we see is that around the genes that are downregulated down following the, following the R4 knockdown, uh, we see an enrichment of binding sites for R4 and nanog. This is what we would expect. And, and an even stronger enrichment of R4 nanog binding sites. So this is typically how we, tar we, uh, we define target genes, is that these genes are differentially regulated if you remove the factor, uh, and they have binding sites in their promoter that suggests that potentially these are active and functional sites. Uh, but now with this data, we can ask the question, um, you know, if we have OP4 binding sites that overlap nanog, are they enriched in proximity of um, in, in proximity of uh, the downregulated genes, so this here is the same as what we just saw. There are there's a twofold enrichment. If we ask for R4 binding sites that are conserved with the mouse, they're also enriched, but not more. Uh, and what's interesting is that if we ask for binding sites of R4 that are embedded in these repeats, the ERV1, they're even more enriched. So they're really uh, they, they they sort of fit our definition of what. Uh, of what potential target genes evolve for. But again, all of these are human specific because these families of repeat don't exist in the mouse. So this says that you know, the, the binding sites for R4 that are embedded in repeats are not second class citizen. They look just as good as the ones that are uh, outside or even conserving mouse. So we get examples like this where we get genes that if you look at human, if you look at mouse, there's absolutely no signal of finding um, and no expression uh, changes in expression of that gene, but you look in the, in the human locus, uh, of course, you know, that's analogous to that, and you see here sort of the track of repeats. You've got binding sites that are embedded in, in, in the repeat, and, and that particular gene in this case is also differentially regulated if you remove R4. Um, so I'll get back actually to, well, so finish this part. Um, so, so in this case, we end up with, with a, a list of new potential target genes in the regulatory network of human ES cells, uh, where all of these genes are differentially regulated in human, not in mouse, uh, and contain binding site for all for and nano uh, that, that are new again. So all of this is happening in the human or primate lineage, different from the ancestral state uh, that also exists. Um, so this sort of confirming or supporting this hypothesis that you know these short sequences that are jumping around our genome, uh, you know, potentially have this role of, of sort of of, of modifying and rewiring uh, these regulatory networks because it, as we've seen, if they carry these regulatory motifs and regulatory uh, enhancers around, they're, they're sort of you know, picking up new targets as they're moving along uh, the genome. So I'll get back. I'll get back to this story with some uh, some new results that actually you know look at these at some of these target sequences a little bit. But, but before that, I wanted to talk about um, one other study that sort of follows on that one that makes use of the ANCODE data sets that I mentioned. Uh, so this study uh, that was published recently makes use of DNA's hypersensitivity sites uh, uh, that are part of ENCO. So the assay here is a little bit different than ChIP-seq. What the, the assay does is actually, um, what it does is that, it, so, so regions that are accessible by this particular uh, enzyme are, are cut, and, and then you sequence these regions, and then you map them in the same way. But here the clusters correspond not just to regions that are bound by a particular protein, it just corresponds to regions that are accessible, that are in open chromatin. But there's a very good uh, 
correlation between these regions being enhancers. But this is sort of more general than just you know a region that's bound by a particular factor. So we made use of ENCODE data set, as I said, uh, some of these initial releases uh, that, that were generated as part of ENCODE coming from Washington and Duke University. We have to do quite a bit of work of filtering the data sets. Uh, but we merge all of this data to basically define in the human genome 1.6 million regions that correspond to regions of open chromatin in these different tissues and different cells. So 1.6 million enhancers, basically, uh, as, defined, as defined by this ENCODE data set. Uh, for each of these regions, each of these enhancers, we can look to see if we can find the autologous region in mouse. So the majority of these enhancers, uh, 900,000 of them, we can actually find the corresponding sequence in mouse. Uh, others uh, you know, end up being either primate specific or in some case even human specific because that region, uh, it, you know, based on the, on the UCSC multi-genome alignment, does, isn't in the, the chimpanzee genome. I mean, there's some, some caveats of, of whether, you know, but you've done this in, a multi, in, in different ways and, and the results don't change so much. So the majority are concerned with mouse, but then you end up with the list of, of regions that appear to be primate specific. But now if you overlay the annotation of repeats on top of this data, uh, what you see is that even in the conserved findings uh, and conserved enhancers or conserved regions of open chromatin, uh, you have, of course, some overlap with repeats. Repeats are everywhere, so that's maybe not so surprising. But as you move towards the regions of open chromatin, and again, this is a functional assay of being accessible, you see that the proportion that's actually derived from transposable elements really increase quite significantly. So, you know, the bottom line from this is that if you're looking at open chromatin, which is, you know, as a, as a functional assay, 44% of all human open chromatin regions are in repeats, but this goes up to 63% if you're looking at primate specific regions. And this, you know, going back to what I said before, it's not completely surprising given that most of the new DNA in the genome is in repeats. Um, but again, uh, so is this, is this uh, expected or by chance? I'm just highlighting another example uh, just to give you a, you know, a sense of what the data looks like. So this is similar to the one I showed before. So this is in human ESL. The repeat family this time is LPR9B. Uh, there are 700 uh, instances of that repeat in the human genome, uh, but 246 of them are in the regions of open chromatin. Again, depending on your model, you would have, you know, this is much more than what we would expect by chance. And so we can actually uh, flag these repeats as being interesting uh, because they're found in open chromatin more than we would expect. Uh, so you may ask, well, why, why are certain families found in open chromatin but not others? Um, well, again, you can look uh, within, so this is sort of a compressed graph of all of the LTR9B instances in the genome. Uh, they're all the same length, roughly. And then if we map motifs for different transcription factor, uh, we, we can find motifs um, that are overrepresented in these transposable element families. In this case, again, I said that this particular family is open in stem cells. These are factors that are found in stem cells, so this makes a lot of sense. Uh, this is the aggregate DNAs profile around these regions. And again, it's exactly where you would predict the region to be active, that we see uh, the repeats being, uh, being accessible, and not the flanks, and not in cell types where these factors are not found. So it really looks like there's direct association between certain repeat family and certain uh, transcription factor. Uh, but now we have a full list, and I, you know, I don't have until lots and lots of other examples of families this one, LTR13, it contains a motif for CPCF. And again, we find uh, that that's exactly the region that tends to be in open chromatin. Uh, we find examples like this where it's kind of hard to see, but you know, you've got repeat families uh, that drive, uh, that are associated with open chromatin that's specific to a cell type, and that's also associated then with expression only in that cell type. But, uh, um, so <laughs> this 
just to summarize this part, uh, the conclusions are not. So some of this work was picked up by the Institute of Creation Research. Uh, and here's what they concluded from, from reading these papers. So according to them, uh, a biblical perspective predicts high functionality throughout the genome with traces of the uh, So the high level of functionality of transposon is more consistent with creation. Uh, so that, those are not my conclusions. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and it's like, I, I read this and I'm like, why am I doing all of this? <laughs> Defeating the purpose. The conclusions are, from my perspective, um, that transposable elements have contributed a lot of, of the regions of open chromosome in the human genome, and especially in primate specific active region. Um, well, I didn't, I didn't go over this, but there's lots and lots of association between transcription factor and transposable element. Um, and, and so, you know, this, it really looks like these types of sequences have been a major source of innovation in our genome. Um, well, just to, to, to wrap up on, on, on that, that part of the story, because it's related, uh, but I won't give much details on this, but uh, we were talking about expression and, and perhaps uh, linking up to new genes, uh, you know, new enhancers that are actually uh, uh, regulating genes next to them. But we realize in this case that I mentioned before, this LPR7, is that it's not so much the genes next to it uh, that were expressed, and this is a you know, that's, that's what we saw from using microarray data. When we looked at RNA-seq data, what we realized actually is that it's the repeat itself that was being expressed. I can't tell from this so much, but we had, the repeat itself was highly expressed in these stem cells, and we followed up with experiments that showed that if we knocked down the expression of the repeat, uh, the cells actually uh, went on and differentiated. So it looks like in this case, it's not so much that it acquired new functionality by having, by recruiting new genes into the network. It's a transposable element itself uh, that's, uh, that's actually associated with some, you know, the, with the pluripotency state in the stem cells. But I won't really go over that. Um, so in the little time that I have left, so I, I'll, I'll cover the last point. Challenges with, with uh, next-gen sequencing analysis and a few strategies, but I'll, I'll won't hold you up too long. Uh, I'll, I'll take questions after the, afterwards if you're interested. So um, this is a snapshot of the type of data that we generate at the, at the Innovation Center. So I mean we've been in business for much longer than that, but you can't see it on this scale. Uh, this is when we acquired 11 high seeks. By now we have 15 high seeks. And, and we anticipate generating 300 trillion bases of DNA this year. Uh, this is the equivalent of the 3,000 human genome at 30x. It's, it's quite a lot of data. Um, I, I calculate we're, we're far from getting to the moon and if we stack it up, but we're getting close to out, you know, going outside of the atmosphere. So it's like one step at a time. Uh, but associated with that, of course, are the cool applications, but there's also a lot of challenges. Uh, so again, you, you, know, you look at our fleet of 15 instruments. This generates in the 10 days of a typical run 300 terabytes uh, of, of intensity files. This is not even the image file. This is just the intensity files. Those we need to you know, bring down to reason quality files of fast queues. Uh, but this is still uh, 15 terabytes of, of raw data per run, which you know, lasts maybe two weeks. Uh, there's new upgrades that are coming out where um, you know, the, the throughput of each instrument is going to be eight times the amount because it's going to be two times more but four times faster. I'm like, yes, it's so much fun. Um, you know, just so, so the types of, if you, if you look at one large project, but still a typical project of cancer sequencing, we've got 500 tumors that we do want to compare with 500 mesh samples. That's comparing 125 terabytes to 125 terabytes. You, know, you, you need to plan this a little bit. Um, so how do we do it? So, so we do it uh, by having you know, a relatively decent sized data center and the innovation center itself uh, with quite a bit of memory. But no matter what, we, I mean, it's already 80% full. So whatever we have, and we just install it, not even two years ago. So whatever, you know, whatever we have, we never have enough. Um, we've also been working, and I was talking about that just uh, at the discussion session before, but we've been working in partnership with Compute Canada quite a bit. Uh, 
so we're lucky to have two of these centers uh, that traditionally have been used mostly by, by physicists and, and, and uh, chemists and so on. Uh, we have one site that's at, at McGill itself that has 30,000 floors now, and another site at Sherbrooke that we've been using uh, and migrating our analysis pipelines on as much as, as possible recently. So if you look at uh, the center, we have uh, pipelines. So this is us. You know, these are some of our stable pipelines for chip seq or seq. And again, the, the bulk of our challenge are more for whole gene, exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. But we've been migrating these pipelines to uh, the various to Canada centers uh, and migrating a lot of our usage um, to these. Uh, so if you look here, uh, you know, from not using Compute Canada at all. Uh, last year, we really split our use between our own cluster and, and, and that, that shared cluster. Uh, and, and going forward, we really hope that the growth will be uh, on, on this shared uh, infrastructure. And anybody can get accounts on these resources, so it's really quite, uh, quite convenient. But on top of that, so one of the projects that we recently uh, got funded, uh, this is funded by Kennedy and, and Gino Quebec, uh, is, is trying to sort of simplify the installation of these, uh, both the databases and the pipeline on these different clusters. Um, you know, we, we were ourselves struggling with reinstalling always the same thing and being able to migrate and use multiple sites. Uh, so, uh, so, so some of these were some of the goals, I guess, that we wanted to address. Uh, so the project itself, and again, I sort of encourage you to go with and look it up if you're interested, but we're building now uh, with uh, these, these uh, large centers, uh, infrastructure for virtual machines. So we're installing UCSC and Galaxy in these clusters, uh, such that it's not just for high performance computing, but that we actually have access to these data sets. Uh, this is maybe a bit technical. And the other thing is that we've been installing, as I said, all of our pipelines that are all sort of freely available and anybody can use and run. Uh, so if you have your own data sets, you can actually just just make use of these pipelines or install your own if you want. But, uh, but some of the common tools are then installed uh, for everyone. And, and we're doing this because we generate a lot of data for many users, and we want to sort of encourage them to actually uh, not just rely on us doing the analysis, but being able to replicate whatever analysis that we've done and do it anyway they, they would like, changing parameters and so on. Uh, so again, I mean, I don't have much time to go into the details, but. Uh, you know, we'll have within the uh, VM environment uh, facilitate the installation, the deployment, I guess, of, of various types of services like UCSC browser, like Galaxy. Uh, but uh, but again, and this is sort of not closed at all. This the idea there is that because Compute Canada, anybody can get an account. Anybody will actually also have access to resources you know, to these, these softwares. Um, our pipelines currently generate uh, very nice HTML reports. Uh, so again, everything that actually we, uh, we produce uh, to sort of simplify the analysis is now available and anybody can use and regenerate. Um, the, last, the last few things that I wanted to talk about is uh, going back to what I mentioned earlier, uh, the epigenome, the IEC, uh, the International Epigenome Consortium. Um, so we're part, of, we're part of this consortium and we've been working on a tool to try to, uh, to sort of facilitate access to some of these uh, data sets that tend to be all spread out. Uh, so if some of you are familiar with ENCODE, uh, UCSC is great because at least at the level of process data, uh, you know, you can easily load all of the ENCODE data sets in your browser because uh, through, through interfaces like this where you've got the different cell lines on top and the different factors, and you can click and select whatever you want to see. But the interface there to actually get, you know, access the data that's available is, we find, is a little bit uh, challenging. And so in the context of the consortium, uh, we, one of the things that we've been working on is, is the following. So again, IEC is a consortium that can actually be, that sort of regroups data sets that have been generated by ENCO. Uh, by roadmap, which represents the bulk of the data sets that have been generated so far, but it includes additional data sets that are now being produced uh, by Blueprint in Europe and by Canada, uh, in, in, in both at McGill and at uh, the BC Center. Uh, so, we, so in this context, everybody is actually developing and deploying their own track hubs, which is a, I you know, we'll go in details, but I think is a great way of of, of, of uh, 
sort of distributing the setup of, of these large data sets such that they're viewable in UCSC. But, but we've been building additional tools that are sitting on top of these track ops to actually display what data is available. So this is, again, data that's coming from different track ops set up by different people. Uh, but you can then click and select the data set that you're interested in. And then you view these data sets in a grid that's now uh, that's dynamic in the sense that you can again select and choose which data set that you're interested in seeing, whether it's at the level of who pre generated the data or at the level of uh, the type of data, whether it's transcriptome or so on. But you can really sort of manipulate and decide in this interface uh, which data set you want to actually view, but at some level do some processing as well. And so now we're working on additional functionality that would actually help you find good data sets as opposed to all the data sets. So one of the problems that we've struggled with is that some of these data sets are not all of equal quality. So, so from this interface, we also hope to actually be able to uh, sort of flag uh, similar data sets to your data sets or whether your data sets are good or bad. Uh, so these are some of the things I guess that we're working with. So in summary, um, consortiums like ENCODE and Roadmap and IAC are at some level, mapping all the functional elements of the human genome. So it's not just me that's doing that. Uh, so there's many opportunities, I think, to, uh, to, to, and that, you know, I hope I've shown you that with one of my the examples from my lab of using some of these data sets for, for new discoveries uh, that you can then follow up with additional experiments. Uh, but at some level, we also need new strategies uh, to sort of process and navigate through all of these massive data sets. Uh, and, and clearly the old model of, of single data repository uh, you know, is, is, is broken down, is, is, is breaking up because there's too many data sets that you can't just download them all for your own uh, little analysis. So I think development of tools a little bit like what I've shown will actually allow you to sort of navigate in a sort of di distributed way what's available, uh, I think will, will become more and more important. So I went over time, so with that, uh, I'll stop and just thank uh, various people, mostly here are people from the platform of the Innovation Center uh, and also the people, my collaborators in Singapore and in Hux Lab that have done this, this minimum. So, stop here and thank you. Thanks, Steve. Any questions? I have one. I was a maze geneticist for a long time and we used to actually cross lines with, we have new sort of stable lines and then we'd actually activate them so that we could actually see how the elements jumped around and look for a screen for photosynthetic use. So can you actually activate the transposable elements in, and sort of study how they pull things out? Right. So I mean, people have done that, so not so much in human, but uh, yeah, yeah, so, so or, or that's right. So in, and in mouse, for instance, they're much more active. So the different strains of mice represent, and, and same in Drosophila. So there's definitely environments where they're still active and very active, and so they're being studied in all of these other ways. It's easier. Uh, in, in in our work, the challenge, I guess, is that we realize that. that yeah, maybe the time scale is too long, and then using mouse as the output, there's too many differences, right. and so we're we're doing more things that are sort of now looking at primates, uh, specific elements, and how that's changed. Well, I was wondering if you took a cell line or something and, and just sort of generated so many things there. that the elements would move, but I... I well, yeah, in so humans. But, but in humans, they're it's not really active. Yeah. Yeah. Even though, in, you know, there's reports that they are active in neuronal development and things like that, but this is still forbidden. Uh, yeah. Yes. So in some of the uh, response to the ENCODE project, people uh, criticized them for, for making a definition of function that wasn't based on um, evolution. And here you're, you're studying elements that you know, ENCODE would call functional, that, that you know, by definition, they're so new, you're not yeah. able to, to you know, conservation or selection every time. Yes. Do you, do you have a comment on those definitions of, of functional and uh, oh, it's, useful? It's, a, it's a very good question. So I, I mean, I didn't go into a lot of details on that part, but to me, um, so one of the things, especially for studying transposable elements, so I disagree with their definition of, of functional elements, 
especially in the context of these transposable elements, I also don't claim that everything that's actually lighting up is functional at all. And the challenge there is that the default state is active. So when the element enters the genome, the false, they're active. So what we actually have to study is the rate at which they're decaying, the rate at which they're no longer active. And I think that's how we could tell which elements are functional, potentially. But again, there's a very, I mean, the, I guess the, the, it, it's the, the, the way these elements are, are evolving is very different than if you're acquiring an enhancer and then trying to preserve that particular sequence. It's very different than the way these, because these guys are coming in at very active promoters transcribe heavily. They get shut down. And so what we have to do here to actually identify and piece out which families and which elements are functional is to study and sort of model exactly the rate at which you expect them to be decaying under a neutral model, and then see whether you're diverging from that. Uh, and, and honestly, so that's one of the things that I'd like to be doing, but I haven't really started to do in detail. The way we've identified the families that are interesting here is sort of a simple test, just saying this family really looks unusual because it's old, and all of its elements are still active, but, but we could definitely improve on that uh, and, and sort of refine the model to really identify and pinpoint which elements really sort of stand out as potentially functional. So we do need to go back and look at the evolution of these elements to tell which ones are functional and definitely totally. One more question, and then we'll move over to the reception. Alan, you can go. And then we'll go over to the thing, and you guys can talk to Geek. We'll be here for another. <laughs> so maybe bit. maybe we have the same question. So there's still hope. So, uh, you you showed that that in, at least in your stem cells, the bound transposable elements are active yeah. in a few examples in nearby the gene. And I guess I was, and you could see those genes changing expression. I guess I was curious though. What about the million or the hundreds of thousands of binding sites? Oh, or sorry. Of, of transposable elements, are they also actively transcribing something? The ones that you showed were associated with DHSs and other things? So, I mean, there we didn't have perturbation data as we did. So that's a little bit less direct and a little bit harder. What we could show in this case is that there was also an association in some cases with the expression of, you know, uh, uh, actually one example, right, where you with an element that's cell-type specific in terms of being active, and then the gene next to it is expressed in the cell right. types. So we could see a little bit of that. Well, I, I guess I'm curious about the thousands of ones that are not associated with gene. So, I mean, the, you mean too far from the gene? Yeah, they're cells? just all over the, this 50% of the genome that is. Well, I think so. The majority of that to me is just noise. It's not doing anything. And so it's, there's no TE transcription? No. And there's no transcription of the gene That's next to it. And again, it only has to do with what I just mentioned, the fact that they were active at the particular time, and it takes time for this profile of being an open chromatin to decay. Mm -hmm. And we really have to study that decay rate, or expected decay rate. But it's tricky because it's going to depend on you know, the number of motifs or the, 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 you know, the ancestral sequence to begin with. Right? And, but that, you know, we should talk about if you have ideas, because I think that's quite interesting. Okay, thanks guys. Thank thanks, Guy, and thanks, Orange.